Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number 12, ready for teaching on December 17. It's titled The Biblical Worldview, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again as we open your word, as we look to see what you have for us this week in these Sabbath school lessons, that we just pray that we will see Jesus, that as we open your word, that we may more fully understand who you are, what you mean to us, and what you have done for us. And as we pray, we pray particularly today for those in Northern Ireland, for those in Pakistan and Papua New Guinea and Rwanda who are listening, and those in Samoa and Scotland and the Seychelles and Sierra Leone and Singapore and the Solomon Islands and the Pacific, those in South Africa, in Sri Lanka, in St Helena in the Caribbean, in St Kitts and Nevis in the Caribbean and St Lucia in the Caribbean. Lord, I pray that each one who's listening, wherever they're listening, whether it be in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Lord, we just pray that your blessing will be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our memory text this week is First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read that again, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation speaks of two major globalizations prior to the second coming of Christ. Revelation 13 describes the globalization of error, when all the world will marvel and follow the beast from the sea. We start in Revelation 13 verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered and followed the beast. And verses 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And verse 12, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And verse 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Revelation 14 highlights the globalization of truth, when the everlasting gospel will be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue and people, as it says in verses 6 and 7. During these distressing times, we read in 2 Timothy 3.1, every wind of doctrine will be blowing, as it says in Ephesians 4.14, and as it says in 2 Timothy 4.4, People will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. From the Great Controversy, page 588, we read, Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. End of quote. Until these final events unfold, we must remain firm in our belief in all the truth that we have, which includes the nature of humanity and of death, as we seek to be guided by the Holy Spirit with the purpose of being ready for Christ's glorious appearing.
Sunday, December 11, The Model of Jesus. Read Luke chapter 2, verse 52. What four dimensions of Jesus' growth are mentioned in this passage? Luke 2, 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. Jesus was the perfect human being and his growth comprised all basic dimensions of human existence. According to Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom, mentally, and stature, physically, and in favour with God, spiritually, and man, socially. His mind was active and penetrating, we read in The Desire of Ages, page 68 and 69 with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb, and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. End of quote. Read Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. How can the threefold ministry of Jesus, to teach, to preach, and to heal, be carried on by us effectively today? Matthew 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kind of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. If we recognize that a human being is an integrated and indivisible person, then we cannot restrict our religion to spiritual matters only. The truth actually embraces our whole being, covers our entire lifespan, and comprises all dimensions of our life. Our physical and spiritual elements are so powerfully integrated that they really cannot be separated. And though, as fallen beings, we will never be equal to the depiction of Jesus as presented above, we are by God's grace to emulate it because, as we read in Education, page 15 and 16, to restore in man the image of his Maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind and soul, is the work of redemption. This is what God seeks to do in his people as part of the process to prepare them for his return. And so to finish the day, in contrasting ourselves to Jesus, we could easily be discouraged by the difference. How then does focusing on the cross and what it means protect us from being disheartened by what we see in ourselves as compared to what we see in Jesus? Monday, December 12. The Body as a Temple The dualistic theory of a mortal body with an immortal soul has generated various theories about the human body. For example, for ancient Greek philosophers, the human body was the prison of the soul, which was liberated by death. In an echo of this pagan concept, many Christians today believe that the body is the temporal housing of the immortal soul, which will be reintegrated with the body at the resurrection. By contrast, pantheists make the human body divine. They believe that God and the universe are one and the same. For them, all things are God and the human body is part of the one, single, integrated and universal divine substance. Surrounded by conflicting theories on the subject, we must stand firm on what the Bible teaches regarding the nature of humanity. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and 1 Corinthians 10.31. How can the understanding that our bodies are the temple of God and the temple of the Holy Spirit positively influence 
our lifestyle. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And 1 Corinthians 10.31 Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Both Adam and Eve were created in God's own image and likeness, which was reflected not only in their character, but also in their physical aspects. We now look at Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Because that image was marred and even hidden by the presence of sin, the work of redemption is to restore human beings, including their physical health, to their original condition, to the degree possible for beings unable to partake of the tree of life. This restoration is a lifetime process that will be completed only at Christ's second coming, when the corruptible puts on incorruption and the mortal becomes immortal, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 53 and 54. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The Apostle John wrote to his friend Gaius in 3 John 1, verse 2, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. If we recognize that a human being is an indivisible entity, and that religion embraces all aspects of human life, then we should consider the protection of our physical health also to be a religious duty. We should be guided by the inspired principle of 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. But remember that we still live in a world where good people can do their best and yet suffer the consequences of a sinful human nature and a sinful environment. So we should trust in God and do our best and we leave the results with God. Tuesday, December 13, The Mind of Christ Some people believe that by changing the environment, the individual will be transformed. Definitely, we should avoid places and circumstances that can make us more vulnerable to temptation. As we read in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And Proverbs 5, verses 1 to 8, My son, pay attention to my wisdom, lend your ear to my understanding, that you may preserve discretion, and your lips may keep knowledge, for the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, Her feet go down to death, her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable. You do not know them, therefore hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. But our problem with temptation and sin can be solved only by the transformation of our own hearts or minds. 
Christ touched the core of the issue when he stated in Mark 7, 21 and 22, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. This means that our minds need to be transformed in order for our behaviour to be changed. Read the following texts, 1 Corinthians 2, 16, Psalm 24, 3 and 4, Romans 12, 2, Philippians 4, 8 and Colossians 3, verse 2. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? First of all, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. And Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Philippians 4 verse 8 Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. The Lord had promised that under the new covenant, he would put his law in the minds of his people and write it on their hearts, as you read in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And we compare that with Hebrews 8, verses 8 to 10, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after the those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And Hebrews 10, verse 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. It is no surprise, then, that in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ broadened and deepened the meaning of God's commandments to the level of thoughts and intentions, as you read in Matthew 5, verses 17 to 48. And that reads, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, 
that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Furthermore, it has been said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But, let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, for whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as also. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, we can gain victory over temptation only by God's transforming grace. And, at the level of thoughts and intentions, we should claim that promise to stop sinful thoughts. We will always have sinful natures until Jesus comes. But, if we are in Christ, we are covered fully by his righteousness. Although we are not yet perfect, we are considered already perfect in him, as you read in Philippians 3, 12 to 15. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. 
When we are united to Christ, we have the mind of Christ, Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 337. Purity and love shine forth in the character. Meekness and truth control the life. The very expression of the countenance is changed. Christ, abiding in the soul, exerts a transforming power, and the outward aspect bears witness to the peace and joy that reign within. End of quote. Only by a daily surrender, a daily death to self, a daily determined effort by faith to be obedient to Jesus, can we have this kind of transformation in our lives. And so to finish the day, imagine what your life would be like if you could stop even sinful thoughts. How different would your life be? What is the only potential way to have this become your experience? Wednesday, December 14. The Guidance of the Spirit The Holy Spirit is God's powerful agent who pours out the love of God into our hearts, leads us into a true saving experience, guides us into all truth, and empowers us to fulfil the gospel mission. Each of those points we find in a text. The first is the agent who pours out the love of God into our hearts, Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us and leads us into a true saving experience. John 16, 7 to 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And verse 13, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. That's guiding us into all truth in verse 13 and empowers us to fulfill the gospel mission as we read in Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Because it is the Holy Spirit who counteracts the degenerating work of Satan, it is no surprise that Satan tries by all means to distort our understanding of the nature and work of the Holy Spirit. While some deny his personality, others emphasize the gifts of the Spirit over his transforming power. Read Acts chapter 8 verses 4 to 24. Simon the sorcerer of Samaria wanted to receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit without being regenerated by the Spirit. How is this very same attitude still being manifested in our day? Let's begin Acts 8 at verse 4. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralysed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practised sorcery in the city, and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him, because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptised. 
Then Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them, They had also been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. The children of God are those who are being guided by the Holy Spirit into all the truths of God's word, as we read in Romans 8.14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And John 16, verse 13, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And John 17.17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Jesus warned in clear terms in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This means that the Holy Spirit never guides anyone away from God's word, which he himself inspired, but rather always leads us into conformity to that word. The same Holy Spirit that guides us into all the truth also empowers us in leading others into that wonderful truth. As you read in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. While fulfilling our sacred mission, we have his special assistance. So, morning by morning, we must kneel before the Lord and renew our vows of consecration to him. If we do this, he will grant us the presence of his Spirit with his reviving, sanctifying power. We must, however, be open to his leading by making conscious choices every day to do what we know is right and avoid what we know is wrong. That is, only by seeking in our God-given strength to live as we should live will we be open to receiving the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which God promises us. And so to finish today, why is it so important morning after morning to pray ourselves into an openness to the Holy Spirit's leading in our lives?
Thursday, December 15, ready for his appearing. We live in a frenetic world with too many artificial needs and eye-catching distractions. If we're not careful, these can take all our time and pervert our priorities. This is not just another byproduct of our globalised cyber world. Christians in every age, to one degree or another, have to be on guard against Satan's attempts to distract them from what really matters in this life. Who, if not careful, is not in danger of looking away from the Lord and dwelling on worldly, carnal things, things that, in the end, cannot ultimately satisfy us, and that, in the end, can lead to our spiritual ruin. Read Second Peter chapter three verse fourteen and First John chapter three verses one to three. What difference do you see between preparing ourselves for the second coming and being ready for that glorious event? Second Peter chapter three verse fourteen. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And First John three one to three. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Often the notion of an ongoing preparation for the second coming becomes an excuse for procrastination. This notion can easily lead one to relax under the evil servant's assumption, my master is delaying his coming in Matthew twenty four forty eight. Read Psalm 95, verses 7 and 8, Hebrews 3, verses 7, 8 and 15, and Hebrews 4, verse 7. What are these verses saying to us about being ready right now? Psalm 95, beginning at verse 7, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. And Hebrews 3, verse 7 and 8. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness. And verse 15. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, and Hebrews 4 verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. From the biblical perspective, the time of salvation is always today, and never tomorrow, as we've just read in Psalm 95, Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. And further, unless a major conversion experience takes place, we will continue to be what we are right now. Time itself does not convert the unconverted. If anything, unless one is continually growing in grace and pressing on ahead in faith, the tendency would be to fall away, to become hardened, sceptical, cynical, even disbelieving. From this perspective, we can say that every single day of our life is our life in miniature. So, by God's grace, we should plan for the future, but should live each day ready for the return of Jesus. Especially because, given the contingencies of this life, today could be our last day. And so, to finish today, how can you, today, be ready for the return of Jesus were he to return today? Discuss your answer in class on the Sabbath.
Friday, December 16. The great controversy is nearing its end, we read in Maranatha, page 220. Every report of calamity by sea or land is a testimony to the fact that the end of all things is at hand. Wars and rumours of wars declare it. Is there a Christian whose pulse does not beat with quickened action as he anticipates the great events opening before us? The Lord is coming. We hear the footsteps of an approaching God. End of quote. And then from an article written by Ellen White in the Signs of the Times in October 20, 1887, titled The Light of the World. Live the life of faith day by day. Do not become anxious and distressed about the time of trouble and thus have a time of trouble beforehand. Do not keep thinking, I am afraid I shall not stand in the great testing day. You are to live for the present, for this day only. Tomorrow is not yours. Today you are to maintain the victory over self. Today you are to live a life of prayer. Today you are to fight the good fight of faith. Today you are to believe that God blesses you. And as you gain the victory over darkness and unbelief, you will meet the requirements of the Master and will become a blessing to those around you. End of quote. And from the same author, in the book called Heaven, page 165 and 166, the Lord is soon to come, and we must be prepared to meet him in peace. Let us be determined to do all in our power to impart light to those around us. We are not to be sad, but cheerful, and we are to keep the Lord Jesus ever before us. We must be ready and waiting for his appearing. Oh, how glorious it will be to see him and to be welcomed as his redeemed ones. Long have we waited, but our faith is not to become weak. If we can but see the king in his beauty, we shall be forever and forever blessed. I feel as if I must cry aloud, homeward bound. We are nearing the time when Christ will come with power and great glory to take his ransomed ones to their eternal home. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, how can the notion of the person, body, soul and spirit as an indivisible whole, help us better understand the all-encompassing scope of religion and the importance of our personal lifestyle? Two, all true revivals and reformations are theocentric, centred in God, not anthropocentric, centred in human behaviour. How does the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector illustrate this principle? We read this parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And question three. In class, discuss your answer to Thursday's final question. How can you know if you are ready and can you have assurance without being presumptuous? And now for Inside Story, a mission story with Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. Jesus vs. the Dragon by Andrew McChesney 
Something strange happened to Q in northern Laos in late 2020. Her body, and especially her belly, started to swell. Her worried husband Cheng took her to the local shaman who informed them that a dragon had impregnated Q and intended to take her away to an underwater world. You need to give animal sacrifices to abuse the dragon and to call back Q's spirit, the shaman said solemnly. Cheng gave the shaman everything he demanded, but Q got worse. Cheng turned to traditional healers for treatments over the next two months, but nothing helped. He spent everything on shamans and traditional healers, but Q's health continued to deteriorate. Finally, Cheng thought about asking a Christian pastor to pray for Q. Two Seventh-day Adventist leaders happened to be visiting Q's village at the time, and after praying for her, decided to send her to a hospital in Laos capital, Ventian. At the hospital, the physician diagnosed Q with nephrotic syndrome, a kidney disorder whose symptoms include swelling linked to excess fluid retention. But after a week in the hospital, Q sank into a coma and was placed on life support. She was transferred to the intensive care unit, where the doctor gave her a 50-50 chance of survival. He asked who would pay the high medical bills to keep her under his care. Cheng spoke with his relatives, but they did not have the money. The Adventist leaders who brought Q to the capital and paid her initial hospital bills also lacked funds. Faced with high bills and no assurance Q would recover, Cheng made the difficult decision to remove her from life support and bring her home. It was painful to send her back home to die, but there was nothing we could do for her, a church leader said later. The only hope left was that God would show mercy and perform a miracle for her. Days after returning home, Cheng called the Adventist district pastor to ask him to pray for Q in their home. The pastor who arrived with several Bible workers lived far away. He decided to stay for a few days so he could also assist with the funeral. As the family waited for Q to die, the pastor and Bible workers fasted and prayed daily. Instead of dying, Q improved. She began to breathe easily on her own and the swelling subsided. By May 2021, she was walking without help. Today, Q is a living testimony to the people of northern Laos that there is a God in heaven. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.